Hello everyone, welcome back. Today I'm with my good friend Matt Aldewood at his home studio. And uh, thank you, Matt, for having us over today. Thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful place. I've, I've been over here a couple times kind of just helping you out with drums and testing out the room, and because you just used the, the raw house as it is. Yeah. But that's really cool, because it actually sounds really good. You were just showing me stuff, and you know, I'm really excited about projects you're currently working on. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I'd like to just kind of start off by like how you got into this, and what kind of made you kind of go down the path of recording. Um, so I was, uh, I mean, I was a musician first. Uh, I started writing songs, I mean, as early as like 11, 12 years old. Uh, and then I needed, I needed a way to record the song. So um, I, uh, I got into GarageBand first initially. I didn't know anything about recording, but I knew that uh, there was this, you know, Apple had the software called GarageBand where you can like record songs and stuff like that. So I, I started like just trying to learn however I could with like YouTube videos and, and uh, stuff like that. Everything I made then was awful. It was terrible. I fell flat on my face a million times. I remember that time yeah. period, you know. <laughs> I think we all have to do that, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I went through all that. I got pretty discouraged, um, but then uh, I remember after high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, so I just, I, I went to school to learn about recording and then, um, yeah, I mean, once I, once I had the education and uh, I realized why I was falling flat on my face, I, uh, I felt like I had a grasp to do something good with it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's basically how I got into recording. At that point, how long had you been kind of fidgeting with, with it? Um, let's see, so, so before, before the education, I, I mean, I was like, I don't know, because I remember, you know, being like, you know, in those junior high ages trying it, and then like early high school, but then later high school when I was like working and stuff with my band, um, I, we would go to somebody else for a recording. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there, there was like a, a time where I realized, okay, I'm not good at this. I'm not going to be good at this anytime soon, so I should go to somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took trying it by myself to realize that and realize like how, how much of a journey uh, recording is, or at least uh, to get good at it. Um, so, I mean, there was there was like a time where I fell off, where I was like, I'm not I'm not gonna, you know, do recording. Uh, so I don't know. I guess there was like maybe a a three four year time period when I was trying it, and then took like maybe like a two year break and then got back into it. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah, but I wouldn't consider those four years uh, to be anything really. That was just like. <laughs> That was, I was in the dark. I had no idea what I was doing and I was just a kid. Being that you're in a house, how uh -huh. do you kind of, do you find that you are out of necessity doing things a certain way? Or do you, how you perceive recording and production, does it, is it affected at all by the fact that you're in a house? Uh, I think it's, I think it's affected. I think definitely it's affected. Um, I'm in a house because I have to be. <laughs> right. Right now. Uh, but, I mean, you can, you can roll with the punches and still make something good. Uh, I mean, I have like uh, like gobo panels, bass trap panels, whatever you want to call them, that I will use to try and um, deflect like you know walls, mm -hmm. like drywall. Uh, and carpet, carpet's not terrible. It's it's not like really nice wood flooring, but you know, right. it uh, at, at least it's an absorber. You know. Um, do you find yourself tracking a uh, certain way? Like, do you find yourself tracking live or? <laughs> Uh, separate or does it not matter? Uh, sometimes it matters. I mean, I've been trying to get out of live, uh, but bands still want it. Um, and I've been doing, I've been wanting to get out of live because I want to be able to like just focus on, I want to focus on people's performances mm -hmm. more because when, you, when you're when you tracking a band live, um, you know, if, if one person messes up, you have to stop the entire recording for that one person, right? Basically, so it's kind of counterproductive in uh, the performance aspect. Uh, as far as like the sonics, though, there's not a huge difference, to my ear at least, uh, because you can still layer on top of your your live recording. So as long as you still have, as long as you get like really good drums, mm -hmm. basically, um, and uh, and you know good bass to work with, which is not hard. I mean, just get a DI, right? Um, you, you know, you're pretty much in the clear for, for the live recording thing. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not like super detrimental, like recording in a house. Um, because you could still put up, um, you know, 
you could still treat the room with absorption and stuff. And you can you can just take a couch. You know, a couch is an absorber. Right. Take a couch. Take couch cushions. Pull them up. Put them where you need them. You could just. I mean, it's. Uh, it's not like the most professional looking thing, but it could sound right. professional. Well, I mean, that's as, the point. I mean, you met me at at a warehouse. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's it was where, a cool warehouse. Yeah, and, and totally not professional. Yeah, right? I mean, I, I don't, I don't care. I don't yeah. care about the the flashy <laughs> professional things. I just care about how things sound. Mm -hmm. A lot of bands come to you wanting to do live. Yes. Which is what I think is funny and interesting because, like, when I was coming up, um, not not long before you by any means, but. Uh, a lot of bands, like, I wanted to track live because I thought it would be better because I, I always had issues with uh, musicians tracking the clicks. Oh, they, okay, yeah. Well, because they would come to me and it was, you know, during a very, very strong push of the whole, like, digital thing and mm -hmm. everyone was, like, chasing perfection, which I understand. Yeah. But I don't think they realized how difficult it was to play to a very monotonous kind of, you know, just a, yeah. a click track and then having everybody stack on that. Especially, in, even in rock and roll, like music has to have a groove or a swing oh, or a, definitely. a feel. Yeah. Absolutely. And if the first member of the band doesn't know how to realistically ignore to kind of inject that, that motion of music, yeah. uh, it, the whole project turns into this. Right. And I was always fighting bands to track live for like four years. Mm -hmm. I was like, and they were like, nobody does like everybody actually used to do that. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, I try and, uh, you know, if I say if like, if something feels a little fast or a little slow, we can change the click track in the middle of the song. Okay. And I'll, I'll try and push for that to just say like, okay, the chorus, let's just bump the chorus up to two beats per minute. You know, just to give it like some excitement. You and know? do you do you do you do that by like having a guitar player in here, and mm -hmm. he's just he's just kind of running through the song, and when he yeah. hits a point, it changes, and you kind of map it up and down from there. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. I uh, I try and push for not one tempo the whole song, right? Because that's not natural. Nobody does that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I try and like you know, choruses maybe a little faster. Uh, you know, if something sound if something just kind of comes down in the in the song. I say, hey, let's just drop this like two two beats per minute, something like that. Something like that you don't really, people aren't gonna say, oh, that dropped two beats per minute. People are just gonna feel with it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So um, that's, I used to push for bands to, to record live too um, because you get all feeling right. from that. To like map out a, a click track and to always think in your head, how does this feel? Instead of like just trying to make it perfect is will get you a lot further in music, I believe, than setting like, you know, uh, one tempo for the whole song and then just like, you know, going through and lining up the drums to that exact tempo and, and trying to, 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 to pigeonhole, uh, you know, human musicians into this computerized sound for the entire song. Um, if, if you get your head out of that a little bit, and try and focus on the feeling. I feel like you will you will get a little further. Mm -hmm. um, granted, your musicians are good. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that uh, you know professional records uh, need to like not be edited. I'm not saying that at all because you know that that can get you far. Just as you need to just keep in your mind feeling and what musicians actually do when they play their instruments. Right. Uh, and that that's what I'm really trying to do. I'm just trying to create. Um, really good sounding recordings that still have a humanistic feel to them. Um, and I, and I do edit a little here and there and I do, uh, like drum sampling and like pitch correction on vocals, that kind of stuff. But whenever I start to use these things, I always just keep in my mind, I don't want to make this person sound like less of a person. I just want them to sound like a better person. Mm -hmm. So... So it's kind of out of out of to go back to kind of like necessity again, not yeah. so much like oh I want to use a drum sample or tune the vocal because it needs to sound big budget huge production kind of thing or or yes or no I'm, I'm asking um, I don't think there's a wrong answer right right no no no, no. Mm -hmm. I I mean I, I what I'm saying is is that I will use the things that will take a little bit of the humanistic aspect out potentially, mm -hmm. but I'm making sure that I'm not doing that. Right. If that makes sense. So, I mean, it, it's kind of hard, it's kind of hard to explain because you can go too far. That's, that's to, to kind of emphasize that, that's a big deal. Um, I feel like 
naturally I came up through recording and one of the first one of the first sessions I spoke to this, with this to Jalapaz a little bit, like one of the first sessions I ever did, the engineer like immediately took the raw tracks and like when I went back to the control room, it was like coming back at me altered. Yes. Yeah, one way yeah, or the yeah. other. Right, you know, right. whatever he it was just it was altered is uh -huh. the point. And um, I, I definitely noticed. Yeah. And at the time, as as kind of ignorant to the process as I was, I just thought, oh, it's like I guess that's recording. Yeah. Um, it, it would take like a few more years to pass for me to realize that, oh, like there was a raw element there and I might have been interested in hearing it, even if it was bad. Right. Because I think that's a good learning curve for musicians just to kind of like, I think- There's a charm to, to yeah. raw. There's well, a charm to Well, there's that, it. but there's and also like, I, I feel like you're doing them proper, you know, justice and teaching them that pro like you told me, what is it? Like you said, you sound about half as good as you think you do. Or yeah, I tell everybody, something. if you feel like you're ready to cut a record, <laughs> mm -hmm. you're only 50% as good as you think you are. Right. when you feel like you're ready. So basically, when you're at 100%, you're actually at an F, about a 50%. You suck. <laughs> you suck. I'm sorry. That's Every, and I suck too. When I, I feel like I'm like ready to sing something, and then I listen back to myself, and I'm like, ah, uh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's a bit, true. That's a bit harsh, but I mean, I, I can I can definitely... I'm very harsh on myself. <laughs> I can relate and feel that, like, you know, I mean, hearing through microphones... And that's that's definitely like one of the hardest thing about just learning how to be good at recording. Like yeah. that's what we suck at for so long is being able to use these devices that essentially are trying to replicate how our ears hear it. Yeah. And microphones on paper can hear way wider ranges than our ears. Depends on the microphone, but Depen yes. depends on yeah. the microphone. And we're trying to put them in places in rooms and stuff to kind of sound how we hear it in the room and but like yeah. our brains interpret so many harmonics and you know, reflections uh -huh. and stuff differently than a microphone. So right. I think I think that, that 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 totally is understandable. Like when you come back into the control room and you're like, like as a guitar player recording yeah. guitar, it took me forever to figure out how to mic a guitar amp so that it didn't sound like it was a speaker directly in my eardrum. Okay, you know, yeah. and yeah. and kind of going, oh, but that's not what it sounds like out there. But I'm right. standing, you know, eight feet away from it. Right, exactly. Don't put ends, a don't you know, put a mic right up to the grill cloth. Yeah, or yeah, you know, back it up a little. <laughs> figure out how to how to record that stuff. So I get it in that respect. Um, but totally, I, I think that the point was that definitely having musicians learn that hearing hearing monitoring back the raw audio is a big deal. Yes. Absolutely, and, and I'm glad that you do that because it was it was made it was made. Uh, People deserve to know. Yeah. People well, deserve to know well, that too, honestly what you sound like. And I'm surprised, like, how many studios and engineers kind of, like, load up sessions and, like, just kind of immediately play back already altered stuff. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to sit I here I do and, see the point of it, though, yeah. because it's like, uh, you, you want them to be happy mm -hmm. with their performance and everything, and then they might be like, oh, I don't sound as good as I thought right. I sounded. But I feel like people deserve to know what they honestly sound like, because I want bands to know that so that when they go play a live show, mm -hmm. they you know, are actually rehearsed for that and they're not, you know, like these big ego right. people that are like, ah, oh, I went to the studio today and I was perfect. Right. And they don't yeah. realize that uh, you were perfect because a computer made you perfect. Or what, you know, whatever, <laughs> you, know? you know, like I, I definitely don't want to condemn anyone's process because I... Oh I, yeah, no, neither do I. Yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been on both sides of it. I've been in situations where a band came in, uh, you know, kind of back when I recorded like anyone that was willing to record with me, I'd have yeah. bands come in that I didn't know yeah. Um, and they weren't as good as I was expecting and they weren't as good as they realized. Yeah. And yeah, like if I didn't do anything to kind of doctor it up right away, it was like, oh, you're a bad engineer. Oh, so yeah. So I've yeah. experienced that. Side and then you of just got to do it, do it their way. You know? Right. Uh, to, a, to a certain <clears throat> point, you got to understand what a band wants mm -hmm. and then you got to give it to them. Right. Um, but I would still go out of my way to be like, here is pitch corrected and not pitch corrected, just so that you know, just so that you know honestly. Right. Because people deserve to know, and people. I mean, and if they don't want to know what they actually sound like, I mean, that's kind of a problem. Because I mean, what are you going to do when you play live? Right. Well, you know this or that, but uh, I, I think that it, at the very least, it, it kind of like shows the importance of working with people. Yes. You know, absolutely. because it's like yeah. I have my way of doing things, and I'm I'm much more strict on the lack of use of those tools than, than like you. And that's that's kind of one thing that kind of draws back to like, yeah, like working with specific people and kind of the point of these videos mm -hmm. is to get people to understand how people perceive and hear music. Yeah. All right, so the Neotech. Um, I was really jealous when I heard that you got one of these because I've always really wanted one and hopefully one day I'll still be able to get one. But why'd you go with the Neotech? Um, well, it was... Uh... 
It was a board that was in my price range. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I read that the, the mic pre's and the EQ's were both high end. Um, uh, Steve Albini uses one, he uses a Series 2 in his B room. Uh, both so, of his consoles are Neotex. Uh, you're right, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is a Series 1. Uh, I read that it does have the same mic pre's and the same EQ's, just about as the, uh, as the, um, the Series 2. Uh, it has the, the four band parametric EQ. Um, yeah, I mean, I I got a really good deal on it. Um, I got it broken actually. The power supply was busted, and you came over. I remember that, and you yeah. helped me uh, bring it back to life. So, uh, and I actually did that for a, a school project to graduate from from MCC. And that that is um, a hefty school project. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a pretty cool. That was the coolest thing I've ever done in school ever. Uh, was get this Neotech broken. Uh, it was it was in storage for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a big it was a wreck. It was dusty. It was I had to like scrub the the grime off of it for a while. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah, it was it was disgusting. Um, and then yeah, the power supply down there. I just had to give it a recap. Uh, I had to uh, I changed some other parts in some some of the the channels. I remember three and four. I think needed a recap as well. Um, and then after I did that, it was it was uh, everything was fully functional. So it's been running smooth since, no problems really. Uh, I mean, here and there, like if something comes up, I'll I'll have to figure out what. But it's pretty easy, wrong. pretty easy to work on. Yeah, I mean, all the channels work. Yeah. I mean, everything that I want to use on it is working right now. Right. The way I use it is, um, I basically. The way I, I view analog gear versus like digital gear, digital like plugins, is mm -hmm. I, I view analog as a broad brush stroke. It's like a it's a fat brush. So you can you can paint a painting with all thick brushes and it's probably more of an abstract painting. You know what I mean? Like it could you can make something cool with all analog gear, but it's you're not gonna get into the specifics whereas like, you know, with a with a like a like a digital EQ, right. like a you know, ones that typically come with DAWs, I can mm -hmm. notch out little frequencies and I can go in there and I can be really specific with things. Right. So how I have like, you can kind of come over here if you want to check it out. I have uh, this Blackbird and Root EP uh, and I have it stemmed out onto the board. So I have, I mean, I put up more than two drum mics, but I have the stereo mix of the drums coming on two channels. And then I, there's like, I don't know, like six to eight guitar tracks, uh, but I have them all summed to a to basically a stereo return. stem yeah. stereo return yeah whatever you want to call it and then I'll go through and I'll kind of like give it a broad EQ to yeah. start with so you know on the drums I have like you know 15 16k boosted and like 6k boosted so I needed like some more brightness out of the the cymbals and stuff right. so I started there you know I, I'll go in my DAW and I'll kind of like level things out to where they sound right and then I'll I'll uh, kind of process them as stems first top down mixing I believe. We talked about that once. Yeah, yeah. another night. Bit, so basically, yeah. it's like top-down mixing. When I'm on, when I'm on top or doing the broad things, I like to do that with analog gear. So, I also have. I know in this mix, I have the uh, the guitars compressed with my my HM2 nail. Right, you've from, got an interesting from a little rack of compressors here. So what do we? Uh, uh Jay, do you want to? Why don't I go over here? Uh, so yeah, this is. Uh, so a, at the top. Yes. This is a tube VCA compressor from A Designs. It's their HM2 nail. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really cool compressor uh, because there are two thresholds. So basically, it's like the best way I could do it is visually. So here's th regular threshold, uh -huh. and here's hard threshold. Once audio passes this guy, you won't hear it. You'll only hear the compression when it passes this threshold, but it will sound compressed according to this one. So like. If, if it's 10, 10 dB of gain reduction mm -hmm. between the two, you won't hear 10 dB of gain reduction until it passes this. Okay. It's kind of almost another way to look at a, a, a ratio. Uh -huh. It's good for, um, I mean, if you want to like really compress something, but really compress like transients, for mm -hmm. example, like really come down on those, you can set your normal threshold way low, but then take your, take your hard threshold and set it so just the transients are going to get smacked according to how. Hmm much you're compressing with the regular threshold. And then it also, you know, there's a stereo link on and right. off. So like I, in tracking, I like to use it on snare, like snare top, snare bottom. Oh, and dual mono? Yeah, dual cool. mono. Uh, and then, yeah, you have the, um, the side chain, attack and release, gain. Oh, and then uh, wet to dry ratio. 
Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah I forgot about that. Forgot yeah. That's on there. It's a, it's a really useful tool. And um, as far as like tube compressors go, it's very clean. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a good tool. It's not super, it's not a super like mojo kind of tube compressor yeah. with a bunch of color. But yeah, I, I've, super, the more I use it, the more I love it. Super functional. Yes. Do, how, do you, uh, how do you like the warms? The warm audios are great. Um, they, they sound like 1176s. Uh, they sound better than uh, any plugin I've ever used of 1176s. Um, and they have all the features of the, uh, the universal audio ones. I haven't done a shootout. Uh, Versus another version for, of it? Yeah, but I mean, I don't feel like I really need to. I think they do with what I want them to. It does its thing, right? Right. And then um, underneath those, I have the DBX-160s, which are, uh, I love on drums. Mm -hmm. They have like the perfect, like that perfect 15 millisecond attack time. And then uh, like a fast release that just works so, so uh, wonderfully on drums. Mm -hmm. they're, they're great. They're, the metering is fantastic on those. And yes. They're, they're wonderful and tracking for that little bit of a kiss. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, just to kind of like keep those super hairy transients from breaking speakers and stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then underneath, underneath that, I have my, uh, my Vintec X73i, which is uh, it's supposed to be like a, a Neve uh, 1073. With the EQ? Yes, with the EQ. Um, that's just a great sounding preamp, great sounding EQ. Is that like your kind of like main pre for vocals or anything specific? Or? Um, it was for a while. It depends on the mic I'm using because right. if I'm using like a, a bright condenser mic, I like to use these preamps down here actually. The, uh, the Universal Audio uh, 610 preamps, this is the oh, 2610 yeah. box. Uh, so if I'm using a bright mic on vocals, I'll, sorry, I have my patches in there, I'll move that up. Uh, if I have a, yeah, a bright, like a bright condenser microphone, I'll use one of these preamps. Uh, if I'm using like a like an SM7B or maybe like a ribbon microphone, I will use the uh, the Vintec because that's a brighter preamp than these. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, these I love these preamps. They sound glossy. Anything tube sounds glossy to me. Yeah, that's the best way I could describe the, the sound of the tubes. The tube and EQ is strangely very very usable. Oh oh yeah, definitely. Especially on vocals. I mean, if you put it at 10K, you just give it a click and it's like, mm -hmm. oh, there's the air. Absolutely. <laughs> but so yeah, and then the Have you the been links. liking the, uh, the links? The links taught me a lot. That was, um, when, I bought this, when I bought this console, uh, my, when I did it for that school project, my teacher uh, <laughs> uh, said, you are going to realize that you don't like a lot of your mics because of how clean this board is. And that never happened because I was using that, that Motu converter. Mm -hmm. But once I started using this Lynx converter, I realized that there was a lot of stuff I had that I didn't like because I could hear my recording so clearly. So like, um, I realized that I needed more, I needed to treat rooms better. Like oh, yeah. I needed, like I could start hearing the room more. I started hearing so much detail that I realized, oh shit, like, I, I have what I need to step step up my game with the converter and how clear the converter is, but I also need um, to figure out your space a little bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it gave me the leg up to realize that I need to figure out. I some had stuff. that exact yeah. same experience when I went from uh, like I think I went from one ninety twos to radar. Okay. And yeah. that. I mean, you could hear the room on the 192s. They're not, I mean, a lot of people rag on them, but they're still, mm -hmm. they're, you can still make a record on 192s. Yeah. But when I went from that to radar, I was like, whoa, my room sounds like a box. Yeah, that's, well, that's what happened to me too. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to like talk bad about like my own space or whatever, but I realized that, oh, there's, there's like greater potential now. Yeah, well, I mean, like, and you address it, you learn it, and you know, you, you, you figure it out, you adapt. It's not one of those boxes yeah. where you buy it and all of a sudden your recordings sound instantly better. It's like your recordings will sound worse, but you at least have the device to understand what you're doing. It's, yeah. like, it's like cleaning a window and seeing through it, right. or cleaning your mirror, and then you realize, oh, that's what I actually look like. Right. Okay, now I have the tools to realize that and do something about it. I think in the long run, you'll find that it'll make your recordings better. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I, I have a better understanding of what I'm doing now. Right. I can hear everything that Absolutely. I'm doing. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, your monitors. I always like to talk about people's oh, monitors. Oh, yeah. Um, so these are the, uh, the Yamaha uh, HM8s. I believe that's what they're called. They're not the, um, they're not the, old, the old ones. What are they uh, called? I, I'm not familiar with the Yamahas too much. Okay. H, H something. 
the eight inch speakers, and then there's the sub down there that goes with it. Is it the matching sub? Um, uh, it is the matching sub. It might be kind of a mess down there, but it's down there. Uh, yeah, they sound great. They're really flat. Uh, as far as like, I remember I got them. I got them at Guitar Center. There was like a, a, a studio monitor deal that they were having uh, years and years ago. Um, but this was, in its price range, the flattest, the flattest monitors. Yeah. They're, they're monitors that I definitely trust, and that's what you want out of monitors: is something flat, not something that's going to hype up your low end or mm -hmm. hype up your top end. Right. Uh, so yeah, this was the f the flattest monitor I could get in that in that price range. And even even some more expensive monitors, they're, these are more flat than them. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of these Yamaha monitors. I, I would recommend them to anybody that's looking to get into recording. Awesome. So this is your tracking area? Yes, yeah. This is where we, uh, I'll track a live band or track a drum set, something that requires space. It's actually, yeah, it's a, it's a good size. The ceiling is a, is a good height considering. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it bolts, I, I don't, does, yeah. does that help or does that It helps, of, yeah. yeah. Uh, drums definitely sound different on this side than it, they do on this side. Which um, side is better for you? I haven't figured it out yet. Depends on the it, day. It, it depends. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it depends on a lot of things. The drummer, the drum set, what they're playing. Um, sometimes I use this corner. I like that bookshelf because it's basically a diffuser. Um, you know, I, I basically, like I said before, I use just whatever we have in the house as you know, whatever I can use it for. You know, that couch can be an absorber. A, a giant, yeah, absorber. Yeah. And in here you've got some pretty interesting amps. Too. Yes, uh, okay, so I wanna, I wanna talk about this guy. This is a, uh, a 1964 Fender Bassman um, with a 1968 cab. They're technically not matching. You could tell by the Fender logo. Uh, but this is great for like distorted rhythm guitars. It breaks up pretty early but it breaks up in a way that I've never heard any other tube amp do before. And it's just super um, rich in harmonics. Uh, yeah, so if, if, if any band just needs like simple like rhythm stuff with like just like a chime to it, I go for this guy. Um, over here, this is a twin reverb and I believe, I know it's from the 70s. I, I'm drawing a blank on the year. It looks late 70s, yeah. You th you're thinking late, I'll say 78. I was either gonna say 72 or 78. One of those two? Yeah, on one of those two. Either end of it? Yeah. Much um, before our time. Yeah. <coughs> uh, but yeah, this is pretty much the opposite of this basement. This basement's dark and it breaks up easily. Uh, this amp doesn't break up as easily and it's very bright. Um, I love this for leads um, or any, any kind of clean tone that needs to be bright and cut through. Um, and then that Ampeg amp uh, is really nice as well. It's not vintage. Uh, it's monstrously it's, loud looking. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and that's that is the the one bass amp we have. It's it's great. It pushes pushes a lot of air. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I bet. Um, it's really clean. Uh, it doesn't really have much distortion to it. It's pretty simple sounding, but it's great sounding. Um, Who's Epiphone Liz Paul? That that was my first guitar, and it's it's been through some shit. Um, yeah. I very rarely use this. I usually use my other guitar. Not a bad first guitar. Oh, you I know. know. How many times has that broken? Up? Uh, I think two. I think the headstock is broken twice and it still plays wow. really well, actually. Yeah, that's the classic Gibson thing is you just, you drop it, you take it off a rack wrong, you, yeah. anything in the headstock goes. Yeah, it sucks. But, I mean, you can, you can fix them and they still play. Well, yeah, my buddy Alex, I think his, his Les Paul, I think he's, I think he's on three or four now. Really? Times that it's been broken. Yeah. They do that. Um, let's see, what I else see can I show? I still have my snare drum that I... Yes, the snare drum. Sounds great. And my one stick the that tuner, I used to tune the it. Yeah, stick. the tuner stick. I haven't tuned it in a minute. It doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I have a kick drum, just in case anybody needs a kick drum. Snare and a kick. Uh, and then we have mics. MD421. Classic dynamic microphone. What else we got here? What else we got? Let's uh. What are some of like your personal favorites out of this bunch? Of course, personal... you're gonna, of course you're gonna reach for that. Yeah, this is this is my favorite mic that I own easily. I I love it so much I bought two. So uh, this is the AEA R84 ribbon nice. microphone. It is uh, wooly. It is fat and wooly. It is. It's um. Beautiful sounding microphone. Um, I love it on, I mean, pretty much anything I put it on, I love it. Uh, but 
specifically guitar cabs. Um, I used them as drum overheads, and although it was kind of a dark overhead, it captured the drum set just like I want to hear it. Mm -hmm. Like you could rock just the overheads and be like, yeah, that's a good drum sound. And I imagine it, it takes EQ well. You know? It does take EQ really well. Most yeah. ribbons do. Um, yeah, you know, if you had a, I definitely added top end when I used both of these R84s as overheads. Let's move this guy up here. It's 414? 414. Yep. Which version is this? The XL2? XL2? The gold oh, one? So the five, five patterns? Uh, no, there's more. Because you can be in between. Oh, okay. So technically, was that like nine then? I think so. Nine sounds right. That's cool. Yes. Uh, all right. And then what else can I show off? What do you guys want to see? Oh, I love this mic. This is one of my favorite mics. And then you, you actually turned me onto this mic. What is this one? The Biodynamic. Oh, the, the M201. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah this is. Uh, I. I mean, it lives on snare top. Mm -hmm. I can't get it off snare top. But I've also really liked it on guitar cabs. Um, I'm trying to think what else I've used it on. Uh, I think I may have used it on bass cab once. I, I imagine, yeah, I mean, to me, it's, it's, I, it's, it's a dynamic mic that sounds like a condenser to me. So whenever I want like a condensery reminiscent sound, but I need it to be able to take a lot of SPL, I hear that. I use I, that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty hi-fi dynamic microphone. That's yeah. how I look at it. Compared to like a 57, absolutely. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, speaking of 57s, I have three. They come in a cool little box. Check it out. Box 57s. Nice. Yeah. Box of 57s. Um, if you need a, a kick drum sound that's deep in the lows and clicky with the highs, this is your kick drum mic. D6? D6, yeah. Nice. Uh, anytime anybody wants that kick drum sound, that's that, the mic that does that it. That one, yep, right off the bat. The only one EQ. that's very metal sounding to me is the Sennheiser 602. That one has a very like, uh, one. it's very uh, modern, like lots of click, mm -hmm. very smiley, and then like a little boost. Yes. Down in the lows. But this is actually my favorite mic to do on kick. SM7B. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I last time I used the 7B on kick, uh, I felt like I didn't get enough lows. But it needs it needs a it needs an out mic. Yeah. You know, I just like the way that it sounds uh, on the port or in the drum. You know, mm -hmm. if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah. It, I mean, it captures the beater pretty well. Yeah. From my it's, experience. It's. It's. I may have sounding. used the. Um, the roll off. Not the roll off, but the mid range boost. Oh, I think okay. I may have used that. So that's probably why I'm remembering a good I've amount ever, of. Uh, I don't think I've ever engaged those before. I think really? I've always left them flat. Yeah, I should probably try it sometime. Yeah. Uh, there. You will notice them. They're not subtle. Well, thank you, Matt, for having us over today. Thanks for coming. It was awesome talking to you and seeing your plates. Yeah, of course. And uh, as always, I hope you enjoyed it as well.